This Brigham Young University devotional by Elder Bruce R. McConkie was given September 3, 1978. I devoutly and sincerely hope that we may have this night a mighty and rich outpouring of the Holy Spirit for two reasons. First, so that I may say what the Lord once said, what he would say if he personally were here this night, thus enabling me to say words of truth and light and righteousness, and secondly, so that uh, those words will sink into your hearts and you will know of a surety that they are eternal verities. If I may so be guided by the Spirit, I'd like to take as a subject Joseph Smith, a revealer of Christ. And I've chosen a text statement. These words were prepared and published by the First Presidency of the Church in 1935 on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the organization of the First Council of Twelve Apostles in our dispensation. And they said, Two great truths must be accepted by mankind if they shall save themselves. First, that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the only begotten, the very Son of God, whose atoning blood and resurrection save us from the physical and spiritual death brought to us by the fall. And next, that God has restored to the earth in these last days, through the prophet Joseph Smith, his holy priesthood, with the fullness of the everlasting gospel for the salvation of all men on the earth. Without these truths, man may not hope for the riches of the life hereafter. We have a great pattern, a revealed pattern, interwoven in all of the revelations that have been given in all the ages, that indicate how salvation is made available to men on earth. As we all are aware, we're here as the spirit children of God our Heavenly Father. We're here inhabiting bodies, tabernacles made of clay, to be tried and examined and tested, to see if we'll do all things that the Lord directs and commands for his children generally, and for each of us in particular. We're here to see if we will believe eternal truth and if we will conform to the principles so accepted and so learned. And if we believe and obey, we manage to do the things that will enable us first to have peace and joy and happiness in this life, and secondly, to go on to eternal reward in our Father's kingdom. Now, for every age when the gospel is given, for every gospel dispensation, for every time that a gracious God dispenses the plan of salvation to his children on earth, he follows an identical pattern. He reveals two great truths which apply to the dispensation involved. One of these truths applies to all dispensations and the other for a specific dispensation. Now, the truth of universal application for all men in all ages, from Father Adam to the last man, that truth is that salvation is in Christ that he is the Redeemer and Savior of men, that in and through his atoning sacrifice, by the blood that he shed and the 
redemption that he wrought, salvation is available for all men. Because of Christ, all men will be raised in immortality, and those who believe and obey will then be raised unto eternal life in our Father's kingdom. Immortality, by definition and in its nature, is to live everlastingly with a body of flesh and bones. It's to be resurrected. It's to have body and spirit inseparably connected. Eternal life, on the other hand, is to, for one thing, live eternally in the family unit, and for another thing, to inherit, possess, and receive the dignity, honor, power, and glory of God himself. Anyone for whom the family unit continues in eternity will have eternal life, and in process of time he'll acquire all the dignity and honor and glory and power and might and omnipotence that the Eternal Father possesses. Immortality comes because of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a free gift for all men. Eternal life is made available through the same atoning sacrifice, and it is a gift to all who obey the law upon which its receipt is predicated. The laws of salvation are the same for every age. They have never varied. They will never vary. Every man from Adam to the last soul to inhabit this earth must do precisely and exactly the same things and obey the same laws in order to inherit, receive, and possess the same glory in eternity. Well, salvation is in Christ, and in order for men to believe and obey the laws of Christ and the doctrine of Christ which comprise his everlasting gospel, must be revealed in whatever age is involved. Now that is a universal, invarying standard. The gospel did not originate in the meridian of time. It did not start when the Lord Jesus was upon earth. It is an everlasting gospel. It commenced in the beginning, and it's come down in successive periods or dispensations from the days of Adam to the present, and it will continue as long as men are on earth, and always and everlastingly salvation will be in Christ. But it takes a revealer of the knowledge of salvation for whatever dispensation is involved. Our revelation says, salvation was and is and is to come in and through the atoning blood of Christ the Lord Omnipotent. Now we need make no mistake about that. Our affection, our interest, our concern, our love, our devotion, all that we have and all that we possess is centered in the Lord Jesus. But having said that affirmatively and unequivocally and positively, we come to the fact that a revealer of the knowledge of Christ and of salvation is needed for every age of the earth. And so we find such a thing in our revelations as this. Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord, has done more, save Jesus only, for the salvation of men in this world than any other man that ever lived in it. And so for our dispensation, we link the names of Christ and of Joseph Smith. Now I read you these words of Brigham Young. Who can justly say aught against Joseph Smith? I was as well acquainted with him as any man. I do not believe that his father and mother knew him any better than I did. I do not think that a man lives on the earth that knew him any better than I did. And I am bold to say 
that Jesus Christ accepted, no better man ever lived or does live upon this earth. I am his witness. He was persecuted for the same reason that any other righteous person has been or is persecuted at the present time. Now let's take a little vision. Let's reason together a little. Let's figure out how the Lord operates with reference to his children. First of all, we read in the visions of Abraham about the noble and great in the premortal life who were foreordained. Abraham's told that he is one of them. They're identified as spirits, the offspring of the Father. They're identified as spirit souls. And then the account says, And there stood one among them that was like unto God. And this is the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jehovah. This is the firstborn in the Spirit, who through righteousness and zealousness and obedience became like unto God, meaning unto the Father. And he, that is Christ, said unto those who were with him, now follow it, he said to the host of noble and great ones, the ones Abraham had seen, those who were with him, we will go down, not I, Jehovah, alone, but we, the noble and great, the mighty and valiant sons of our Father, we will go down, for there is space there, and we will take of these materials, and we will make an earth whereon these, that is, the spirit hosts of heaven, may dwell and we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. Now who was listed and counted in that great council of eternity, that assemblage of the noble and great seen by Abraham? There's not much question in our minds. They were the people who were foreordained to minister to men in this world. We know a little bit about the order of priority, the precedence and the rank that's involved. We know that the Lord Jesus was number one, mighty, superior, val valiant, intelligent above all others. We know that a spirit named Michael was number two and that he was born into this world as Adam, the first man. We know that a spirit named Gabriel stood third in preeminence and might and in power, and that he came among us as Noah. After that, we cannot specifically and definitely categorize the various spirits, but we know enough to know that the noblest and the greatest and the mightiest among them were ordained to be heads of dispensations, to be the individuals who would commence for their era and age and dispensation the spread of eternal truth on earth. We know of Moses, for instance, who was the head of one of this, these dispensations, that there arose not another prophet in Israel like unto Moses, with whom God spake face to face. Now that sets us a pattern. We know of men like Enoch, who so lived that he perfected his whole city and his whole people, and they were translated and taken up into heaven. We look back at uh, Abraham and consider him to be the father of the faithful, and rejoice that we're born as his seed. Well, there are a limited number of mighty, noble spirits who headed the respective dispensations. How many, we do not know. Perhaps there were eight or 10 or 20 or whatever. It doesn't matter, but we soon have a small group of select individuals who stand in intelligence and power and might 
next to the Lord Jehovah, and in the same sense that he was like unto God, these chosen and select individuals who were destined to head his work for ages and ages, long periods, were like unto Christ. Now, when you begin to sift out the relative importances of individuals without knowing the details, you come up with a conclusion that here is a man born in modern times to head this dispensation who was like unto Adam, like unto Moses, like unto Abraham, like unto Christ one of the ten or twenty noblest and greatest spirits who up to this time have been born into mortality. Now he and hosts with him performed their labors and their work in the creative enterprises that brought this earth rolling into existence. And he and his associates headed up the periods of time when eternal truth went out to the sons of men. Now that's how we rank and how we place the prophet Joseph Smith. He's one of the great dispensation heads. And a dispensation head is a revealer for his age and his period of the knowledge of Christ and of salvation and the other prophets who are associated with him and who come after and who hold up and bear his hands and bear record of him become witnesses that he, the chief prophet of the age, revealed the Lord Jesus and hence made salvation available. Now that means that we go to a testimony meeting in our day and we link the name of Joseph Smith with that of Jesus Christ. We stand up and say, I know that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and that he was crucified for the sins of the world. And in the next breath we say, and I know that Joseph Smith, Jr. was chosen, appointed, anointed, and called as God's prophet for this age to reveal Christ and to reveal salvation. We bear witness of Christ and we bear witness of Joseph Smith. Now that's the way it's been from the beginning. There have always been testimony meetings. If we had lived in the days of Adam and had assembled to worship the Lord, the Spirit would have rested mightily upon us on occasions and we would have said, I know that salvation is in Christ who shall come, and I know that Adam, our father, is a legal administrator who holds keys and powers and authority, and that he is the revealer of the knowledge of Christ and of salvation for men on earth. Now, if we had lived in the days of Enoch, we would have arisen in our testimony meetings and said, I testify of Christ, and I testify of Enoch, who revealed Christ, and automatically I believe also in Adam who went before. And that pattern would have been followed in Noah's day, and in Abraham's day, and in Melchizedek's day, and in every age when eternal truth has been revealed. Always we would have linked the name of Christ and the name of the dispensation head, and automatically we would have believed in every prophet that went before. Now you can't suppose for one minute that it would be possible for someone who lived in the days of the Lord Jesus to believe that he was the Son of God and to reject the witness of Peter, James, and John. That's a philosophical impossibility. Had we lived in that day, it would not have been possible to say, well, I'll believe in Christ, but I won't believe in Peter, James, and John, his apostles, who have revealed him to us and who have borne witness of his divine sonship. The Lord and his prophets 
always go together. Now, with that in mind, let me read these words of Brigham Young. Whosoever confesseth that Joseph Smith was sent of God to reveal the holy gospel to the children of men and laid the foundation for gathering Israel and building up the kingdom of God on earth, that spirit is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that God sent Joseph Smith and revealed the everlasting gospel to and through him is of Antichrist, no matter whether it is found in a pulpit or on a throne. Now, having these concepts and these expressions in mind, I'm going to read to you <coughs> some passages given and spoken by the Lord Jesus, in which he associates himself with John the Baptist. And out of these passages, we'll have an affirmation and a reaffirmation of the truth and, con of, and concept that Christ and his prophets go together, and that it is not possible to believe in one without believing in the other, and that by rejecting the prophets, we reject Christ himself. Now Jesus said this, If I bear witness of myself, yet my witness is true. For I am not alone, there is another who beareth witness of me. And I know that the testimony which he giveth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness also unto the truth. And he received not his testimony of man, but of God. And ye yourselves say that he is a prophet, therefore ye ought to receive his testimony. Now John bore as persuasive and powerful a testimony as we know of as we find in any written record. On those occasions near Bethabara, as he baptized in Jordan, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And that's simply a text statement or a subject head for long discourses that he obviously preached about the divine sonship. On one occasion, John said this, and it's as blunt and as plain as any witness. He said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John said, Here is Jesus, he is the Son of God. Now, there was no possible way to believe John was a prophet and reject the Lord Jesus. If you accepted one, you accepted the other. Now, Jesus said, John came unto you in the way of righteousness and bore record of me, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and harlots believed him, and ye afterward, when ye had seen me, repented not that ye might believe him. For he that believed not John concerning me cannot believe me except he first repent. And except ye repent, the preaching of John shall condemn you in the last day. Now we could recite that over again and paraphrase the language and apply it to Joseph Smith and his situation in our day. Here's another passage. Then said the Pharisees unto him, Why will ye not receive us with our baptism, seeing we keep the whole law? But Jesus said unto them, Ye keep not the law. If ye had kept the law, ye would have received me, for I am he who gave the law. I receive not you with your baptism, because it profiteth you nothing. For when that which is new is come, the old is ready to be put away. 
and following those expressions came the ones that we're so familiar with about putting new wine in old bottles. In other words, we have new revelation in our day in a new church, just as it was in the Meridian Dispensation. Then certain of them came to him saying, Good Master, we have Moses and the prophets, and whosoever shall live by them, shall he not have life? And Jesus answered, saying, Ye know not Moses, neither the prophets, for if ye had known them, ye would have believed on me. For to this intent they were written, for I am sent that ye might have life. Well, this is a glorious principle, a principle that the Lord and his prophets go together. Here are some words I wrote on one occasion. We be Abraham's children, the Jews said to Job. We shall follow our father, inherit his trove. But from Jesus our Lord came the stinging rebuke. Ye are children of him whom ye list to obey. Were ye Abraham's seed, ye would walk in his path and escape the strong chains of the father of wrath. We have Moses the seer and the prophets of old. All their words we shall treasure as silver and gold. But from Jesus our Lord came the sobering voice, If to Moses ye turn, then give heed to his word. Only then can ye hope for rewards of great worth, for he spake of my coming and labors on earth. We have Peter and Paul, in their steps let us trod. So religionists say as they worship their God, but speaks he who is Lord of the living and dead, in the hands of those prophets, those teachers and seers, who abide in your day have I given the keys, unto them ye must turn the eternal to please. Well, with those principles in mind, let's just be vividly and acutely aware of their application to Joseph Smith. One of our revelations says, this generation shall have my word through you. The Lord Jesus speaking to Joseph Smith. I think he said that either in those verbatim words or in thought content. To every dispensation head there has been. I think he said it to Enoch and Moses and Abraham. In principle to all this generation shall have my word through you. Someone has to reveal eternal truth, and these brethren whom I mention are the ones to whom the Lord gave that obligation. And so we find such things as this. The Lord's speaking here to the church, and he's speaking immediately following its organization on the sixth day of April in 1830. And he's talking about Joseph Smith. Thou, the church, shalt give heed unto all his words and commandments, which he shall give unto you as he receiveth them, walking in all holiness before me. Now note. For his words ye shall receive as if from mine own mouth in all patience and faith. This sets a dispensation ahead from all other prophets. Now here's a subsequent statement about him. Behold, I will bless all those who labor in my vineyard with a mighty blessing, and they shall believe on his words, which are given him through me by the Comforter, which manifesteth that Jesus was crucified by sinful men for the sins of the world, 
yea, for the remission of sins unto all the contrite heart. Well, our discipleship, the measure of our discipleship, what is it? How do we measure and test how firmly we're rooted in the restored faith? I think one of the great tests is the degree and the extent, the fervor and sincerity, the devotion and true belief that we give to the words that came from the prophet Joseph Smith. Now here's a man that first of all gave us the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon, which is an account of God's dealings with the people who had the fullness of the gospel. The Book of Mormon, which bears record of Christ. The Book of Mormon, which recounts in plainness and in simplicity the basic and fundamental truths which men must believe to be saved. Here's a man who gave a book of incomparable value. His words as it were, at least to us they are his words, because it was through his instrumentality that they came. Here's a man who gave us the revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants, revelations which speak in the first person, with the Lord Jesus himself being mouth and voice, but the lips being the lips of Joseph Smith a volume of revealed truth where God Almighty speaks through his prophet. Here are some words that the prophet gave us in the Pearl of Great Price, the Book of Moses, which itself is taken from the Joseph Smith translation of the scriptures, the Book of Abraham, translated from the papyrus. Uh, here are some words in many places in the inspired translation itself, revealed words that come from God by the power of a prophet. Here are sermons, majestic, wondrous, marvelous sermons, which recount the mind and will and plan and purposes of the Lord to men on earth. For instance, the King Follett sermon, which President Kimball quoted copiously from at the funeral sermon of Brother Stapley recently. Well, we talk about judging a man by his fruits. One of the great fruits of Joseph Smith are the words that he spoke, the words that he wrote, the inspired message that he gave. And I suggest that a measure of discipleship, a standard of judgment, whereby we can tell how firmly we are anchored in the faith of the Lord is how sincerely and completely we believe the words that have come from the prophet Joseph Smith. And obviously, incident to this, we have an obligation and a need to treasure up these words, to search out these truths, to learn what they are, and then to make them a living part of us. We bear testimony of Christ, and we do it with all the fervor and conviction and power of our whole souls, and we strive and labor to do it by the power of the Holy Ghost. And as our voice echoes and re-echoes the eternal verity that Christ is the Lord, we say also that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, a legal administrator who had power from God, keys, and authority so that he could bind on earth and have it sealed eternally in the heavens. And that here is Joseph Smith, a revealer of the knowledge of Christ and of salvation for our day. We link the words together in one great testimony of eternal truth. And the reason we have power to bear witness of Christ, through whom salvation comes, is that Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord, for our day and in our day, has received eternal truth, has borne witness, has given revelation, 
has laid the foundation. I read where Brigham Young said, I feel like shouting hallelujah every time I hear the name of Joseph Smith. Well, that is as it ought to be, because salvation is in Christ, and salvation is available because Joseph Smith revealed Christ to the world. Now, the world either accepts that witness and believes in the Lord's prophets, or they go their way and at their peril lose the hope of eternal salvation. You either believe in Adam and Christ if you live in that day, or you believe in Abraham and Christ if you live in that day, or you believe in Moses and Christ if it be your lot to live then, or in our day you believe in Joseph Smith and Jesus Christ, and you cry Hosanna and Hallelujah and praise the Lord whenever their names are mentioned by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm grateful beyond any measure of expression that I have that in my soul there rests the absolute certain conviction that Jesus is the Lord. I know that as well as I know anything in this world. And in that same sense, with unshakable certainty and absolute, pure, revealed knowledge, I know that Joseph Smith, Jr., who headed this dispensation, was the Lord's prophet for our day and our time, and that as he certified, he, in the spring of 1820, saw the Father and the Son, and that as he certified, the revelations and the truths that fell from his lips are the voice and mind and will and purposes of the Lord for me and for all men in our day. Now I pray, God our Father, that we may be valiant and true, that we may stand affirmatively and courageously in bearing witness of Christ, because salvation is in Christ and in none other and that we'll have the same fervor and the same devotion in linking the mighty and noble name of the head of our dispensation with the name of the Savior himself. And that I do by way of doctrine and by way of testimony on this occasion in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. For more information on this program, please visit our website at byubroadcasting.org. This Brigham Young University devotional by Elder Bruce R. McConkie was given September 3, 1978.